Have you ever wanted to know how healthcare companies deal with large amount of data coming from multiple different sources? Well, I've been really curious how our insurance claims, lab reports, and other data is put to use. So today I invited a Molecare VP of Engineering from Vida Health, a really cool healthcare startup creating a personalized experience for patients. Welcome Amol and thanks for joining us today. Thanks Priyanka, looking forward to this chat. Awesome, so tell us more about Vida Health. Yeah, so if I was to describe Vida in one sentence or one line, it would be that we are a digital health virtual care company and we connect both mind and body programs into a single platform. A lot of companies that you see out uh, are often treating patients for one condition and our platform actually supports multiple different conditions. So um, it really helps people when they can go to just one single place and get uh, different kinds of treatment uh, on a single place platform. Well, awesome. So it sounds like there are three different types of customers. There are the individuals like us who may need the help, and then there are health plans, and then you have the employers mm -hmm. who are helping. So let's sure. double click on that a little bit. Uh, what are the challenges you actually set out to solve for these three customers? So as you can see, um, we have a lot of different kinds of data that's coming in, and we have to connect all of that stuff together in a seamless manner. And we have to host this in, you know, we have services that are mobile focused, but there are services that are for web uh, on the back end. And so it's a pretty uh, interesting challenge. And um, I'm glad that we've kind of consolidated everything on Google now. Awesome. So um, ease of use is definitely one that you're pointing out as, to, as the reason to choose Google Cloud. Are there any others? Yeah, as I looked at you know, when we, was, when we were evaluating Google Cloud, really there were three big areas that came to me uh, as like uh, reasons why, why consolidating in GCP was great. One was just the cost reduction because, you know, after consolidating everything, it's just one single place where you can drive efficiency. And we've already seen somewhere around like 50% reduction in, in, in cost just by bringing everything in one place, right? Um, you can optimize, fine tune different things. The other thing I would say was more around, you know, uh, developer productivity, because now engineers don't have to worry about where to deploy and kind of keep that cognitive overload much more lower because they, it's one single place that they know how to look at and monitor. Uh, so they are happy. Uh, and if they are happy, they're more productive, right? And then the final piece I would say is that we had already made a lot of investments in BigQuery and uh, AI and ML. Um, so combining all these data sources in one place and bringing in even things like Google Workspace has proven to be very effective for us to and, and it opened up uh, a lot of interesting new product ideas that we were not uh, thinking of before or not possible before. What are some of the challenges you're solving with machine learning and data analytics? You know, we are trying to, we have three or four different areas of investment in machine learning and, and uh, data, uh, data, uh, data science today. Uh, part of the area that we focus on is how do we make our providers, we internally call it making a provider superhuman. Uh, so building tools and assistive technologies that can help providers become much more efficient at how they do their jobs. Um, as an example, you know, using um, note-taking, automatic note-taking. So because we are, we have the audio and video conversation that's going on, part of the job after a consult is for someone to actually write down the notes for for with the patient or uh, what what if like using nlp and speech to text we are able to just take down those notes for you so that's one area where you know we reduce the amount of burden on the providers so that way they can treat more patients in in some ways and then you know another area where we've tried to help providers is also how can we make their case get get them more patients without burdening them uh, too much so as an example depending on the severity and the acuity of the patient, how can we surface those patients much uh, quickly to our providers? And maybe there's others who are doing already very well, they don't need that much attention. How do you prioritize that caseload? So those are a couple of applications that we've seen on the provider side where machine learning has been very useful um, in, in surfacing this information much more quickly to our providers. From our conversation earlier, I do recall Readopedia, which is another major recommendation platform that you built with data from Workspace and BigQuery. Now, what is it and um, how does it work? 
Yeah, well, first of all, let me explain what VDAPedia is, right? Even without machine learning. Um, so it's a set of protocols. It's uh, basically, you can think of them as like Google Docs that have been written that help the, our providers and our clinicians uh, follow a protocol when certain things happen. Over time, our medical organization, uh, you know, Mike Scahill, who's our, he sort of created a corpus of like almost 150, 200 protocols that help people know what is the right level, what is the right thing to do and what's the right care to give in, in a particular situation. And now, as you can imagine, no human is able to store 200 different sort of protocols in their head at the same time. It becomes a data access problem, right? Like how do you quickly get access to this sort of information at, at high speed? And so what Vedapedia recommendation system does on machine learning is actually we've kind of indexed all those documents and then we look at what patients are, what is the patient provider interaction that's going mm -hmm. on, and then surface the right protocol for a given interaction, right? So if during the course of this chat interaction, the machine learning model detects that this uh, triggers, you know, a particular protocol, then it surfaces that to the provider during the session or even after the session. And so then what happens is the provider is able to, you know, give the right care to, to the patient. And so from our point of view, the provider becomes more efficient at the same time, increasing the level of quality of like the care that they're providing. So the team is pretty excited about that. And we wouldn't have been able to do this if we were not able to connect what the Google Doc pro protocols look like from Google Workspace, take that data and index it and store it in BigQuery and then be able to build machine learning tools on top of that, right? And so you can see pretty quickly by going to Google, uh, one of the things we've been able to nicely connect is the, the Google Workspace data that our providers use to our actual service, um, which is the machine learning algorithms and build it, build a product that's, in my opinion, something pretty unique uh, that, you know, we when we set out to do uh, move to Google. We had not even thought about this, but now that it's there, it just makes applications like this actually possible for us. Yeah, that is so amazing to hear because it is it is one of those unique aspects of using Google Cloud uh, because mm -hmm. workspace data is right there and you can just put it into BigQuery yeah. and start to do stuff with it. Um, now, yeah. obviously, this whole workflow is pretty data intensive, and this is mm -hmm. an architecture show. So let's dive into the details. What does yeah. the data pipeline flow look like, and what are the data sources involved, and how is it making its way through the tools to uh, making it useful in these machine learning use cases that you just talked about? So we ingest data from a variety of different sources, all the way at the beginning where you know, our health plans might send us eligibility files or they might send us, you know, claims data that tell us a little bit more about the member. Then the members themselves will often bring their own devices into the system. So for instance, they might have a Fitbit and they might connect that with the Vida app. So now you're getting to see, you know, the steps that they're taking or the weight or whatever log, whatever they're logging in that. Uh, for diabetes patients, sometimes we ship out glucometers. And so then you get to see, you know, their their sugar readings and, and stuff like that. So all of data is getting ingested. Some of it is real time. Some of it is batched. Um, and and it's we are collecting all of this stuff from, from different. Then even the, on the provider side, the providers are conducting consults and they're taking notes for those consults, right? So that's another piece of data that gets ingested into all of this stuff. And the, the goal of this data platform is at the end of the day, you know, uh, help derive insights and make decisions on top of that, right? And so, you know, our goal was to uh, create a system that's seamless where everything gets stored in one place like BigQuery um, and then derive insights, build build tools on top of that. So um, uh, it's, it's not just BigQuery data, which is sort of uh, yeah, somewhat unstructured, but also structured data and relational data that we get from uh, Postgres and MySQL, all of that ultimately lands in BigQuery for us, and then applications get built on top of that, right? So our analysts work on tools, visualization tools like uh, Data Studio and Looker, and uh, our data scientists uh, build on top of the BigQuery data to build machine learning models and, and connect that to our actual services, right? 
Um, one of the things that we've kind of recently gotten um, used uh, or sort of exploring is how can we use Vertex AI for quickly building these models and deploying them? Like, you know, in one of our recent hackathons, one of the most impressive things about this, this tool was that even like uh, non, I would say machine learning engineers are able to quickly use Vertex AI to try out an experiment and see if if that might be useful. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about uh, the, the the sort of seamless integration of the ingest as well as like the analysis engine that we're building on top of that. That is so cool to hear because we just launched it recently, right, at I.O. And we have an entire series of Vertex AI uh, videos that I've been working on, and we would link those below. So thanks for the mention on Vertex AI and how easy it has made to uh, to use the, the to apply machine learning to any sort of data and make the steps um, easier and accessible to everybody. Now, um, yeah. I'm curious about the transformations. Uh, so you, you talked about where you're storing the data and a lot about machine learning. Um, there must be some sort of transformations happening. What are you using for data transformation? Yeah, today we have, I mean, in the past, uh, we've been we we're writing a lot of custom ETL pipelines. Um, we've learned that, you know, managing them, making them, monitoring them, keeping them sort of stable and running has, has been a challenge. And being a small team, just like we try and find ways to do managed services on Google, we've tried to explore what are other tools available out there, and we've settled on DBT as as the you know the transformation tool that we we plan to currently use um, for transforming some of this data as we move it from one system to another or get it ready for analysis and 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 stuff. Okay, so there's a lot happening. Obviously, there's there's data ingestion, then transformation, and then there's machine learning on top of that. How do you manage all of this stuff in a pipeline? How do you orchestrate this pipeline? Well, I mean, in this case, the answer is pretty simple. I think we just use Cloud Composer for orchestrating the pipeline, scheduling all of this ingest, processing that, and running all of that stuff. So again, uh, having these tools ready and and be seamlessly working well with BigQuery is, you know, beneficial for us. And I think the team has sort of taken that up and, and implemented them in it. All right. So when it comes to healthcare, it's important to address the elephant in the room, obviously, security, right? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about high-level security requirements uh, that you have to look for in designing this system. Uh, so you're right. I don't actually think of it as even the elephant in the room. It's just like always there. And uh, actually, one of the reasons that I forgot to mention uh, when we initially talked about why, what was the advantage of going to Google is that, you know, in the old system that we had, we had these two different cloud providers that we were working on. And one of the fundamental things with security is like, what is your surface area? And we had a lot of data flowing between one and the one system to the other. That creates, you know, that opens us up for, you know, um, so you know, higher surface area where someone can something can go wrong and people can get access to it. So, because the patient data that we have, what we work on is fairly sensitive. We have to be extremely careful of protecting it. The privacy laws around this are pretty stringent. Um, so, actually, moving to Google has been beneficial in, in that sense because first of all we are a small company as, as a startup and so I always tell everyone like you know I would rather just use Google as my shield we have thousands of engineers in at Google who are thinking uh, living and breathing constantly thinking about security and how to secure the Google cloud environment and so just being part of that whole ecosystem helps us um, immensely where we don't have to worry about our own uh, you know, security thing, as long as we follow the best practices that Google lays out uh, for us. And, you know, I think we are, uh, we, we also sort of combining that with like the Google workspace side of stuff, right? Where you can enable things like data loss protection, uh, we can mask PII data, all of these things just become instantly available to us. And we don't have to spend a lot of our mental sort of capacity to th think and evaluate what, what we need to do. It also helps us with our customers, right? Because people are more likely to believe when we tell them like, hey, we've used and turned on whatever Google is um, is doing in this space. Um, also with our um, health plans, for instance, they are often looking for a vote of confidence or you know, they're kind of saying, hey, what cloud vendor are you using? And when you tell them that you're, you're on Google, they're often pretty satisfied with the fact that 
you know, if if it's a big company like that is sort of uh, taking care of the security, we kind of, I, I call it bump drafting behind a big, uh, you know, company like that. No, it's extremely helpful because, you know, a lot of the times we think that going multi-cloud or having things in hybrid cloud is um, is good. But then in, especially in this case, when it comes to security, um, it's it's a little bit like like you said, reducing your surface area of attack is, is the most important thing to think about. Now, we talked a lot about the data analytics and machine learning architecture. I want to pivot yeah. a tiny bit and learn more about the application architecture itself. Now, how is the web yeah. app set up, the compute, the database? I assume it's all normal, standard stuff, but would love to hear about that as well. Because we did this migration fairly recently, right? We moved from a, a different cloud vendor to Google. We were able to work with a Google partner, Jasada, and really use some of the best practices that that are and, and modern practices that that are available to us, right? And so it, it's not very surprising. It's like a standard, you know, um, I would say a three-tier architecture. You have like load balancers at the at the front, which is deployed in Kubernetes engine, Google Kubernetes engine, and then a, a middle sort of API layer that uh, returns like a whole bunch of um, request response. And at the end, you have a Postgres database, right? And so architecturally, it's not that complex. Simple is good, it's easy to scale. Uh, especially on Google, so you know, I, for me, uh, that's been the great thing. Even even the database is like moved over to not like our own custom sort of Postgres thing, but on GCS Postgres, right? and that way, uh, scaling of database, which used used to be a you know big discussion point and debate, it just becomes like a few clicks of a button, and you can now vertically scale a database if you want to. So, well, you mentioned a little bit about migration. How did you go about doing that? So I worked with the um, Google sort of support team that I have, will, um, who I work with pretty closely, and you know we kind of knew that I had made up my mind that we wanted to consolidate our our cloud system into one place, and Google was a choice. And so with Will, we kind of evaluated a few different partners that could help us do the migration. Uh, ended up choosing SADA for a few different reasons. I think they're pretty well known in the industry. Part of the major sort of uh, migration plan here was around how do we transfer all of the data that was in the other cloud system, have minimum downtime for our for our customers, and then also how do we make sure we set up this new system in a much more modern and you know easy to deploy uh, way so that our in engineers going forward can take ownership of that system and be able to sort of continuously deploy in, in the system. We probably worked for about a quarter, quarter and a half to come up with the entire plan end to end. They wrote some of the, uh, they helped us write some of the code around Terraform scripts that can help us deploy to, to Google. And then on the actual day of migration, they also were on hand to uh, make sure we are orchestrating the moves sort of together. So shutting down the old system, migrating data and turning on the new system and sort of stuff. So it was a pretty exciting time, but I'm uh, so glad that it went without a hitch. And, you know, now we're pretty happy with, with this system. It sounds so cool to hear the the backstory of the migration, right? Because we just talked about the architecture, which is the current architecture. And then, um, and then when you hear the migration story and all that goes into it, and teams like Sada and the Google Cloud team and your team combine together, like bring bring the whole thing to life. Um, mm -hmm. This is pretty amazing to hear. Now, what's next for you guys? How are you planning to augment this existing architecture? And what else is underway for Vida? Uh, actually, now the the fun part starts from my point of view because it's all in one place, and um, you know my. Uh, call for the team is uh, now let's double down even more, make more ma use of more managed services that Google offers. And in particular, I'm very excited about a couple of areas, which is the Google Healthcare API and the Fire related capabilities that Google is invested in, right? Um, so historically, Fire has not been a very, you know, it has not had a lot of traction. It's been increasing little by little, but we've heard over the last year, year and a half, things have moved quite a bit in that space. And just like we are storing all this information about medical data in one in, in our own proprietary formats, we want to now start using 
Google's uh, Fire storage as well to start storing the data so that it's easier to exchange this sort of information with other networks outside of Vida. Um, so, so the classic example is like you go to a doctor, they refer you to another doctor for some other reason. Uh, you would expect that your data gets securely and uh, clearly transferred over uh, from one place to other so that the other doctor doesn't have to kind of ask you the same thing again or try and understand what you're trying to, you know, what what are they trying to treat? And so the same thing, same challenges are, are coming for us as well. So if we are treating someone with uh, a condition that we are not, um, that, that we currently don't support, right? Um, and we want to refer them out to someone else, we want to be able to create a system where our data just gets very seamlessly transferred over to another doctor's, like maybe an inpatient uh, experience as well. So this is where I'm pretty excited about because Google Healthcare APIs and the Fire capabilities that Google is building on are just, you know, th things are like where applications can be built on top of. And I don't have to worry about the protocol layer and how is it stored and all that, you know, fun stuff. Yeah, just store the data, let the API do the thing, and just access the API to do the thing. Yeah. Well, thanks, Amul. It was awesome to have you on the show. Well, thanks again for inviting me as well. And um, it was great to kind of showcase how we built Vida on top of Google. Well, we learned a lot today how to set up a data pipeline for healthcare systems, and the most amazing part, how beautifully the Google Workspace data can be combined with BigQuery to create a recommendations engine. Well, if you're interested in learning more, there's an entire blog linked below that dives into the details of how Vida Health and the team at our implementation partner, Sada, brought this architecture to life. Want to see more real-life architectures like this? Subscribe to get notified. <laughs>